So uh, we are really delighted to have uh, Dr. Suraya Shiba with us uh, today. Uh, Dr. Shiba Suraya is a lecturer in the Environmental and Geographical Sciences Department at the University of Cape Town. And she's currently um, undertaking an Urban Studies Foundation Fellowship uh, with us at the Center for Urban Studies and at the Urban Planning Group. And we're really excited to have her with us. Uh, Suraya and her work aims to understand the dynamics and processes that shape urban environments with a focus on cities of the global south. She, her work uh, is on the, the politics of water in the city of Cape Town. And uh, most recently, she does work in the context of the city's day zero crisis. At the moment, she's the PI of a project, City Occupied, which ex explores popular occupations in Cape Town, Sao Paulo, and Bogota. And she is conducting research alongside residents of the CC Cool House an occupied hospital in Woodstock in Cape Town. And I believe uh, this is the focus of, you, of today's um, uh, talk. And the title is Dispossession, Repair, and Making of Alternative Life Worlds, the case of the C.C. Gould House building occupation in Cape Town. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Please correct me, Suraya, if I'm wrong. So without much further ado, the floor to Suraya. The format is, um, for those who are new, um, up to half an hour of um, talk and uh, then followed by discussion. And we aim to always uh, finish within the hour because of the Zoom um, fatigue and all that. So I give over to you, Suraya, a warm welcome and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, just to begin by saying that I've also been a bit sick the last few days, um, so oh. my throat, my voice is a bit strained. <laughs> I might need to pause um, at times, but I will do if my we best. We can hear you very well, so you don't need to stretch your voice. We can hear you very well. Okay, that's good to hear. I'm also sitting closer to the computer, which is why you see my face <laughs> taking up most of the screen. It works um, really well this way. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and then um, begin. Okay, it's quite complex, so I'm going to be reading, um, but hopefully slowly enough so that you follow. So for many urban residents, um, city life is marked by precarity that necessitates tactics of survival and refusal. One important Important form of practice, reflective of and responding to the ubiquitous urban condition. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the because there is a breakage in the line. If I can suggest you speak more uh, slowly and uh, face uh, forward on your computer because it's breaking the the voice somehow. Ah, okay. I'll, okay. I'll start again. Sorry. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. So for many urban residents, city life is marked by precarity that necessitates tactics of survival and refusal. One important form of practice reflective of and respond, responding to this ubiquitous urban condition is the occupation of land and buildings. Occupation refers to the process of claiming property without the consent of the property owner. For occupiers, these practices emerge as an immediate response and necessary to survival, but also as an act of refusal against a system of dispossession. In recognizing that occupation is a central feature of Southern city making, I'm interested in thinking occupation as practice, process, and possibility. This approach resonates with recent, recent scholarship that seeks to re reframe occupation beyond the momentary and as a set of practices, arguing that we need to better understand the dynamics of a makeshift urbanism that results from the juxtaposition of both structural exclusion, but also the possibilities of endurance and social transformation. This attention to sustained practice and possibility is well captured in Sara Ahmed's transformative notion of survival as not only living on, 
but to keeping going in the more profound sense of keeping going with one's commitments. This is a useful reframing of the notion of survival and something that I take inspiration from in this paper. I'm specifically interested in paying attention to the labor of keeping going as an ongoing, often invisibilized, yet essential labor of repairing, repurposing, and maintaining systems that underpin collective life or life making. I focus here on the case of an old abandoned wood hospital in Woodstock, Cape Town, which was occupied in 2017, almost exactly five years ago, by the housing justice movement Reclaim the City. As an occupation of an abandoned building, a hospital located in a high value inner city part of Cape Town, Sissy Goolhouse makes for an interesting case to a consideration on occupation as practice and possibility, and relatedly to a consideration on the labor of repair and maintenance. The paper takes inspiration from scholarship mobilizing an infrastructural lens as a productive site and entry from which to think forms and relations, their temporal un unfolding and to what effect. As Nikhil Anand reminds us, infrastructures as emergent forms are also accretions of human and more than human relations. They are made by and constitutive of diverse political rationalities, past and present. As historical and ongoing relational gatherings, they emerge over time. They connect to the past as historically embedded and to the present and future as falling apart forms that constantly call out for projects of management, maintenance and repair. Hence, as precarious assemblies, infrastructures are both archives and lively, never complete, always under construction. They build material or immaterial bridges between the past, present, and future possibilities. Stephen Jackson argues that infrastructures are earned and, and re-earned on an ongoing, often daily basis. This suggests an incompleteness and a fragility where both apparent stasis and change require equal attention and tracing. In this paper, I am interested in the ongoing labor of earning and re-earning. At the same time, I'm also wary of adopting an uncritical valorization of this labor as inherent, inherently desirable. Instead, I take Jackson's contention that if they are values in design, they are also values in repair and good ethical and political reasons to attend not only to the birth of infrastructures, but also to their care and feeding over time. I take this seriously. My reading of this is to recognize the importance of attending to multiplicity in the ways repair is conceived, valued, practiced, struggled over, and to what effect. I contend that it is politically vital to pay attention to, to split and to name repair orientations and to, to focus on to what end, especially if the objective is the crafting of more emancipatory urban futures. Here I concur with Cohen and Gudwani who argue that there's a double-sidedness to repair and maintenance work. By prying open the walls of maintenance and repair, we begin to fathom the banal violence of our neglect of people and things, but also the everyday virtuosity of practices that renew the conditions of possibility for life. So in this paper, through focusing on the case of Sissy Gould House, I'm interested in reflecting on this double-sidedness, understood as a tension between violence and care. Ultimately, I'm interested in the ways in which notions of, of repair can also open up to, to, towards more emancipatory rad radical futures as a radical repair. But first, some context. So this paper, as Maria has mentioned, is located within a larger project 
city occupied that aims to bring into conversation the practices and possibilities of urban occupations located in three cities in the global south, Bogota, Cape Town and Sao Paulo. The project has been supported by four co-PIs, three research assistants and three postgraduate students across the cities. The focus of my presentation today, as I've said, is specifically on the case of City Pool House in Cape Town, where I have spent most of my time over the last year. Here I list the main research methods that we've used, which I won't go into, but perhaps we can discuss, and also two of the outputs um, that we over already um, um, completed. The one is a zine, and you can see the link to the bottom when I share the presentation with Francesca, you could view the, the zine. And the other is a short documentary, which we have just completed and will be launching soon. I want to begin by giving you a little bit of context about land and housing politics in Cape Town before moving to talk about Sissy Gore House in particular. So in South Africa, occupations cannot be understood outside of an analysis of the vision and the failure of state facilitated housing. In the post-94 context, the state is a key provider of physical infrastructure in the form of housing and associated services, including water and electricity. However, to access state-subsidized housing, households must meet several income-related criteria and are placed in a housing database widely refer referred to as the waiting list. However, municipalities have found it nearly impossible to keep pace with the demand. They build approximately 4,000 housing units per year in Cape Town, and the current housing backlog is in the order of 365,000 households. So keeping up with the demand for formal housing is experienced as an impossibility making modalities of self-provisioning in the forms of occupation of land or backyard dwellings at the back of state subsidized housing almost an inevitability. So what I mean to communicate in presenting this context is that occupations, far from being an expression of individual failure, epitomize the effects of a systemic problem. Furthermore, these informal practices also play a major role in remaking the city as everyday forms of survival, but also as political tactics and democratic governance from below. They deserve to be taken seriously. Instead, the official response has been to largely cr criminalize occupation with punitive and at times violent state responses. I will talk more about some of these as I proceed. Now to Sissy Gore House. So in March 2017, almost exactly five years ago, a housing justice movement reclaimed the city, occupied an old state hospital that had largely stood vacant for 22 years in the gentrifying neighborhood of Woodstock and renamed it Sissy Gould House after an anti-apartheid activist. Woodstock has seen the displacement of up to 200 res residents at a time from blocks or streets where new residential and commercial development is planned. The occupation of Sissy Gore House was initially a temporary politically motivated tactic by activists from Reclaim the City and in relation to Difuna Okwazi, a law justice organization, and it was in, in response to the sale of public land for the development of a private school. However, in the time since, it has become a home to over 1,000 residents, most of whom were either evicted from Woodstock or surrounding areas and are homeless or were homeless, and all of whom are un unable to afford formal rental, rental prices in the area. So this is a quote from Karen Hendricks, who is a chapter, chapter leader for Reclaim the City and also a resident um, of Sissy Gore House. So I'm not gonna read it. Um, but basically what she really emphasizes is that while this emerged as a tactic of resistance, it has consequently become a home over the last five years. So Sissy Gore House, I find is interesting um, in the context of Cape Town for several reasons. Firstly, its location, as I've mentioned, it's located in the inner city in high value residential area 
um, which is very unusual for an occupation. Most occupations have been on the periphery of the city. Infrastructurally, because it's the occupation of an existing building, which is consequently being repurposed from a hospital into a space for life and homemaking. And because of its link both to a movement and consequently as a space that has really just functioned as a space for home for over a thousand people. Furthermore, scholarship in South Africa thus far has largely focused on peripheral land occupations. So this makes this building occupation and its location interesting um, and interesting to pay attention to, specifically to consideration on repair and maintenance. So in what follows, I'm concerned to split and name repair orientations and ends through focusing on Sissy Gould House. I begin by looking at practices of repair at the level of collective life. And then I proceed to discuss a different orientation of repair, what I've referred to as instrumental repair or repair as order making. Ultimately, my concern is to go in search of repair orientations that open up towards more emancipatory futures. So repair is collective life making. An important part of maintaining the occupation on an ongoing and daily basis has centered, in, centered on the ways in which residents have reimagined and remade the building. Both for a different purpose, they have now made it into a home. In a co-authored paper, the link I share here, um, we used documentary photography and interviews with residents to explore this practice of remaking and re rearrangements and identified a series of practices which we termed retrofitting, repurposing, and replacing. I will briefly speak to two of these, retrofitting and re repurposing, um, before reflecting on the risks that I think a valorization of these practices might entail. I then move to consider this differing notion of repair, which operates outside of the occupation, but has a direct bearing on it. So retrofitting is concerned with the material restructuring of internal and external infrastructures. So the image that you see here is that of members of the leadership team. So there's a leadership structure within Sissigal House. And in this photo, they're inspecting a new section, which they are preparing to build for an incoming resident. The leadership team also collects maintenance and repair, a maintenance and repair contribution on a monthly basis. Um, which is voluntary but encouraged and is used to use specifically for that purpose for building repair and maintenance, which is done internally by the residents of the occupation. So as explained by a member of the maintenance team, one month we'll buy bulbs and then replace the bulbs and things like that. The pipes burst or the electricity fails, whatever happens, we use from that money and that's how we do it. We pay for it and we fix it. The other practice that we identified is repurposing. Repurposing focuses on practices and rearrangements of existing infrastructural spaces, infrastructures and spaces for new and evolving purposes. One of the best examples is the central hall. Prior to occupation, the hall served as a nurse's dining room. This hall now serves multiple purposes and, and is linked to, to a repaired and now well-functioning kitchen. So the image that you see here shows Buta Nazim and Nadima, two of the resident cooks in the occupation um, in the kitchen. They cook every Friday and the food is then distributed amongst the residents of the occupation. So this focus on retrofitting and repurposing shows the importance of resident labor in sustaining infrastructures and repurposing materials that otherwise would be abandoned or left to disintegrate. So abandoned infrastructures are now invested with use value, a different conception of value. The link between repurposing and purpose more generally also draws a more direct link between repair and care. So to quote Joan Tronto, um, who reminds us that care can be understood as everything that, that we do to continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. In this sense, these purposeful practices recognize that the living and the non-living are fragile and in need of care. 
Each of these practices relates to what Cohen and Gidwani refer to as infrastructural and social reproductive labor, which they identify as essential to maintaining systems. Yet they also recognize that this labor is gendered, racialized, and under, under or unvalued. It can be detrimental to self-care and to ongoing well-being. Put differently, the work of care, as I've outlined in these concepts of repurpose and retrofitting, is essential and is assumed, assumed an increasing urgency. Yet the risk is that it functions as a practice of mitigation in relation to ongoing slow and structural violence. Here, I concur with Rebecca Solnit, who argues that I sometimes think that capitalism is a catastrophe, catastrophe, constantly being mitigated and cleaned up by mutual aid and kinship networks. In this case, care is vital, but equally can serve regressive ends, supporting resilience and thereby contributing to forestalling the need for deep structural changes in the foundations of contemporary life. So what are these structures that remain and are maintained? What are the mechanics of spatial order making that these everyday modes of repair and care both reflect and respond to? So in the most immediate sense, in, in the context of occupations and locating that within a, a wider structure, occupations exist alongside the continuous threat of sta state sanctioned evictions as a normalized practice. In the context of COVID-19, the city of Cape Town, although not alone in this practice, has continued to demolish homes constructed in occupied land, despite a national moratorium on evictions. This has resulted in violent clashes between city law enforcement and land occupiers and protesters. Most recently, in September 2021, the city, the city council passed what they term the unlawful occupation bylaw. The objectives of the bylaw really are to prevent the un unlawful, what they term the unlawful occupation of land and buildings, and to monitor and control the growth of informal settlements within the city. However, activists contend that the bylaw is ultimately concerned to protect private property, is unconstitutional, and does not comply with all of the, the related regulations, which, which aims to prevent unlawful occupations, uh, sorry, unlawful evictions. Essentially, what the bylaw attempts to do is to allow officials and authorities to determine what constitutes a home and therefore to evict by claiming that the structure is not a home, which bypasses the constitutional obligations. More directly, in the case of City Hall House, the pol political authorities within the city have actively sought to present the occupation as an obstacle to the realization of social housing. They have most recently conducted a survey of the residents of the occupiers with the intention of moving towards eviction. That is the perception or what it appears to be um, intending to do. So I've given you this detail, but why? Um, what I would like to argue is that these municip municipally driven solutions and many more could be cited other than what I've mentioned, including the use of stun grenades at a protest against the bylaw and the most recent raid of Sissi Gore House in early 2022. All of these are also conceived of as practices of repair and maintenance. They, they exist in response to perceived systemic threats. These solutions are presented as a commitment to the delivery of the to the delivery to the deserving and mobilized to restore and maintain order. So this quote is taken from William Shockey, writing for Africa as a country. And I think it's really brilliant in that it explores this continuous labor of normalization of order making and the ways in which this is instrumentalized um, and given legitimacy. So this quote is referring to a moment in July, 2022, um, soon after uh, the lockdown, the very harsh lockdown um, at the start of COVID in South Africa. And what took place was a man, Bulalani Kolani, was evicted naked by the anti-land invasion unit from his shack in Kailicha. Um, and this was an incredibly shocking scene um, of violence, uh, 
violent dispossession. But what Schulke is arguing is that what distinguishes this moment of evictions from all the rest that South Africans are used to is that Kolani was naked. And what are usually unnoticed acts of ordinary cruelty become a recorded, became a recorded episode of spectacular dehumanization. The apartheid regime thrived on this, obscuring of unequal power relations in the guise of an instrumental rationality, which makes us concerned with the proper processes of things and not what ends they are serving. Contemporary South African capitalism learns from, learned from its predecessors a means of determining which lives matter and which ones don't. So important to this reflection is to locate an apparent act of individualized and spectacular violence within a larger rationality, historically located, sanctioned and accretive, where life is devalued relative to opposing values of pro property protection. This is performed through a deferral to in an instrumental rationality and a concern with the proper process of processes of things and not what ends they are serving. Importantly, this too is a form of repair that perpetuates a slow violence. This reading of racialized accretions connects to a recent argument by Gabriel O. Apata, who argues for the understanding of contemporary racism as slow violence that is incremental and accretive as opposed to spectacular. He similarly de departs from a spectacular moment of violence, the murder of George Floyd, to argue that what is invisible but central is the endemic, slow and accretive violence of a lifelong constricting racism that can be understood as a social and embodied su suffocation. Ultimately, my contention is that repair is constitutive of and by diverse rationalities and fragile relations of things, people and institutions. Furthermore, the labor of repair and maintenance is not an ex exclusively quotidian practice, but circulates, is multi-scalar, and can serve completely opposing ends. Through the mundane, banal workings of budgets, planning regulations, and bylaws, differing repair orientations exist as a form of instrumental repair that is also incredibly violent. This is a practice that both necessitates and actively undermines the immediate labor of repair at the scale of collective life that emerges to fill the cracks. Hence, if the concern is with a form of repair of the past to construct more just futures, it is necessary to split and name repair orientations, to ask repair by whom, to what end and to whose benefit guided by what notions of value and care and future imaginaries. So what would an explicit orientation toward more just futures require? To repair injustice and compose another world. Bell Hooks posits that margins can be spaces of radical openness, where spaces of resistance are cultivated and radical possibilities exist. I would like to take this seriously. And so I conclude with a provisional infrastructure for radical repair as openings to compose another world from the present by looking to Sissy Gulhaas for some answers. These thoughts draw on conversations, engagements, and observations with Sissy Gulhaas residents and primarily members of the leadership structure. How am I doing for time, can I just ask? Um, it's half past now, so you can take another few minutes more if you want to conclude. Okay, so I will go through these quickly. There are three different modes of radical repair through paying attention to the site that I've identified. The one is repair as refusal, and I have two quotes here from Be Bebel Lucas, one of the leaders of Sissy House. But I think what is interesting here is that in both instances, it's an effort to think about repair as a refusal to be displaced, a refusal towards a determination about whose life matters and whose life does not. So a determination of, of who gets to live or not, necropolitics in, term, in, the, in terms of, of um, Mbembe. 
The other is prepare as prefiguration. Um, and here I'm particularly interested in the existence of structures in experimentation at Sissi Go House. So aside from what I've already spoken about, the, these, the, 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 the practices at Sissi Go House also include um, collective practices and internal organizations, organizational structures that are key sites for democratic experimentation, organizing, contestation, and to the, to the challenges of occupation. And I think this needs to be understood as practices of prefiguration, the construction of, of alternative social re relations in the present with a view to carve out alternative, more just futures, and also built on more expansive notions of democracy. The final notion of repair as, as in a more expansive sense, it's repair, repair is reclaiming as reflected in the name of the movement, Reclaim the City. Um, and these practices engage, engage in what uh, Faranak Miratov refers to as both invited and invented spaces, defined by strategic state engagement and disengagement at various moments. It includes a range of strategies, including litigation, protest, cross-movement movement mobilization and practicing alternative modes of planning from below. So there's a particular practice at the moment around planning from below that I could speak to, but I, but I will stop there um, for the sake of time. So I just want to say in terms of the conclusion. So I think what I'm trying to get to is that what emerges is that occupations are earned and re-earned through an ongoing labor. They are sites of struggle, uncertainty, but also of possibility. Similarly, repair is defined by multiplicity. Repair can be violent and contribute to structural suffocation, taking this notion from Op Opata, or move towards a more expansive ethics of care that supports life, breath. What is needed is to think more carefully about the range of different arenas in which struggles to advance an emancipatory form of repair as present and future commitments might unfold. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suraya, for this um, a, a very um, interesting, but also um, both interesting, touching, and intellectually challenging um, work. Um, and in my view, you're uh, drawing upon something uh, that is also theoretically very important and interesting. But um, yeah, I would like to, if you can, would like to stop sharing your work, then you can have an overview of uh, everybody. Uh, and then I would like to open the floor uh, for discussion, for comments or questions. Suraya, uh, I think you mentioned to me you wanted me to mention this is work in progress and you uh, also welcome uh, comments uh, to take it forward. Yes, uh, yes so. please, thank you. Okay, so um, please um, raise your hands. I have uh, Francesca first and Tuna. Can I see uh, what questions we have already have? Uh, I have Francesca and Tuna. Maybe we can take uh, both these questions, if that's okay with you, uh, Suraya. Yeah. Oh, and uh, uh, Brownwin as well. Maybe we take <laughs> first and then we continue with Brownwin. Uh, Francesca, please. Yes, I have two very small questions. And also, yeah, thank you for this presentation. Indeed, it is, uh, it was really emotional, I think, at some point. <laughs> very nice. Um, so um, one is about the method you mentioned, the storytelling workshop, and I was interesting to know, interested to know also in this type of context, uh, what is the difference also that you that you perceived with the residents there uh, between the interview that is more like say a personal one and the workshop that is more I guess uh, a collective uh, method. Um, and the other uh, uh, small question is if you had any reflection, because you mentioned that these uh, uh, cases are mainly in the peripheries, uh, in your uh, in your context, let's say. Um, so 
I would like to know if you had any reflection on this also as you are coming to Amsterdam compared to other contexts as well. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Maybe we can take Tina's uh, question or comment as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, Soraya, thank you so much. It was wonderful to listen to you. Uh, let me try to formulate this because I, I agree with Francesca. It's very emotional uh, what you present uh, and it's very rich at the same time. And it made me think of uh, different processes that I uh, witnessed in Turkey when I lived there and occupation in a very different way uh, and in, in many different, um, uh, let's say manners and the consequences for urban lives and then future. Um, of course, I'm talking about uh, a process which is very, very different than what you presented actually, but I think the consequences for uh, the urban society is more or less the same. Um, this occupations that I talk about is from 50s, 60s, uh, when rural uh, people moved uh, to the big cities um uh, we, for looking for a better chance and occupied uh, because there was no housing available uh, in any levels of social or affordable uh, levels but then that process was very much uh, throughout 80s linked to um, construction reconstruction property and rental mechanisms, I mean, urban land rent mechanisms that lead to very complex uh, processes, both for the occupiers and for the urban society uh, in large. So I guess my question is, where do you see this uh, leading to in terms of um, more complex uh, institutional transformations that may be linked to um, um, I guess uh, creating more speculation in the society and um, also misunderstandings in terms of the occupiers because this is exactly what happened in Turkey. Those victims became um, they were blamed for the urban transformations in the cities and at the end they became even worse victims in the third generation of these uh, uh, occupations. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit messy because it's, it's a very complex process and I can try to uh, only link it to understand by uh, linking it to my own experience. Um, so perhaps it's a bit of a comment than a question, but... Um, yeah, I'd like to discuss with you. Thank you, Tuna. Thank you, Francesca. Suraya. Okay, thank you both for your questions. So Tuna, actually going to start with you. Um, and then Francesca, I'm going to come to the question on method um, and hopefully somewhere in that, the, the, the question on peripheries. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to begin with the point you made about speculation. Um, that is very much at the heart of specifically with no, not, not in the urban peripheries. That is, that is still a different mode of disposition, which is interesting to think about because ordinarily, if you think, take the notion of disposition from the work of Harvey, for example, it's accumulation by disposition. Whereas in the urban peripheries in South Africa, there isn't necessarily a clear relationship between accumulation and disposition. There are other dynamics that are driving that disposition, which are interesting to think with and think about. Um, that's one just side note, which I can expand on. But specifically, the Sissy Ghoul House occupation, which I said is an unusual case because it's an occupation in a high value, and I say this, I mean monetary value, part of the city. It's an occupation that is exactly a response to this speculation. So it's a site where people had been living for generations, actually, and several of the occupiers have a history in Woodstock. They, by generations of history in Woodstock um, and primarily had rented space in Woodstock, but because of the, the speculation on the land and increasing efforts by the city council, in fact, to bring in investors 
for residential purposes and commercial purposes, um, the rental was increasingly un unaffordable, untenable. And so that was what pushed people out. And they were in fact going to be pushed, which is what I was saying about this repairs refusal. There was a refusal to go to the temporary relocation areas, which are 10, 20 kilometers out of the city. And therefore the decision to occupy this abandoned hospice hall. So that's sort of the relationship between the occupation as it stands and ongoing practices um, of speculation as we see that are intensifying actually um, in the inner city. And then this point about victims and villains. So I think in the South African case, the presentation of occupiers as villains has always been the case. So especially in the, in the state rhetoric. So there was there, there's very little effort to view occupiers in the view of victim, because the view is that there's state subsidized housing. And so people need to patiently wait to obtain this housing. Um, and in the meantime, who knows what they should do, but the state is not interested in knowing what that is. And when it is, and it, when it is visible, it's criminalized. Um, so it's not engaged. And the structural dynamics that I outlined that are actually driving those practices are not explicitly acknowledged, even though they are in fact known. Um, and then, yeah, I think, I'm not sure if I've missed, I know there's another part to the question. Um, and, and this is about the institutional transformations. I'm not sure if I fully grasped um, that part of the question. For me, I was thinking more along the lines of where does Sissy Ghoul House go from here? And that was what I was trying to say about this state engagement and disengagement. And in fact, what we see is a, like a very real uncertainty about the future, but that now involves this engagement and disengagement with institutions. Um, and it becomes more and more strategic and what that will result in is really unknown. It might be mass eviction or it might be some mode of inclusion. Um, yeah, in fact, I was trying to understand that because in the case of Istanbul, uh, in Tashkışla, uh, the state had all kinds of reasons to uh, basically displace the people um, and they develop new instruments, uh, new laws, new plan, uh, zoning tools, I mean, name it, uh, to bring them like kilometers away. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I was wondering whether the state is actively busy in um, developing such tools, collaborating yeah. with the industry, basically. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I mean, there's, there's also these contradictory tendencies, which is, uh, what I also want to conclude with, which is to sort of not to reify or thingify the state, right? So as much as we might recognize the state is not necessarily explicitly acting in the interests of the people, it's also not fixed. And so they are, we see these contradictory tendencies specifically in this case. And so it opens up questions for the leadership structure in Tessie Gould House about how do they maneuver with different entities of the state um, with the view to ultimately stay. But yeah, it's, it's very, very unclear at the moment um, because there's so much contradiction. Okay. Um, and then this, your, Francesca, your point on method. Um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. For me, the method was something that was very much experimental also. Um, and I think also speaks quite strongly to the point on repair. That was something that I was, I was also reflecting on, but I didn't bring into this presentation that I think Repair is also useful um, as a concept when we think about our methods and we think about our pedagogy. And so um, the use of storytelling in this case was really the intent, which is one of the outputs for the production of the zine, which is really the stories of 14 residents at Sissiko House told in their words and with photographs accompanying it. The intention was to produce counter narrative. Um, and that was also trying to think about different modes of practice, different modes of research method, but also different kinds of outputs as academics that we can produce other than the traditional um, academic publications. Um, but, you know, that was the intention, but in the process, we did realize that having a few, so, so firstly we had five people at a time and that was because of COVID, we couldn't have larger numbers and we ran several of these workshops. Um, but even with that small group, 
it was clear that we needed to then move to more careful, individualized conversations and then drawing on both of those in order to construct something of an understanding of each person that we were engaging. And in some ways, their stories, their life histories. Um, and then the point in the peripheries, I'm, I'm not sorry, I didn't quite understand because I don't really know enough about um, land and housing politics um, in, in, the, in the Netherlands context. All I can say is that in South Africa, peripheral occupation has been the predominant, predominant practice. So for us to witness land and to witness building occupations, it's incredibly unusual. Um, and also for us to witness it explicitly alongside um, a political positioning, an explicit political positioning, as opposed to something that someone like Asif Bayat refers to as quiet encroachment, is also more unusual. So I think that's slightly different perhaps to what might, might be seen in terms of occupations in the global north. So it's interesting to think about um, in relation and, and how these might be evolving. Thank you, Suraya, uh, Brownwin, and then in Gaddis, maybe we can take an Yoao. Uh, Brownwin first. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed uh, the paper. I thought it was fantastic. Um, okay. I just would uh, have maybe a question that draws out some of this, because your work on repair is really, really subtle, I thought. And so you're working with these, uh, putting alongside these different repertoires of repair or orientations, as you say. Um, and so then you, you really went, I felt that you really went towards the practice in order to find this, in order to kind of like uh, not get to, um, yeah, not not allow repair to take on all of this very heavy uh, work that it has come to sort of do in other pieces of work on urbanism, I suppose. Um, but then I wondered about, and you make this, I think, really interesting argument about repair and reproduction and all of the ways in which, like, that doesn't have to be minute and every day. It can be really engaged in domination. I, I really, really enjoyed that. I found it really um, provocative. But then I thought about the... Uh, and I, I feel that you felt the risk of valorization, valorization of the very romantic vision of occupation and mutual aid. But I wondered about the work of making the world qualitatively new, like bringing something new out of the world, which is what I associate with a certain sort of philosophical position of mutual aid. I could kind of see why you excluded that. Um, but I kind of I was curious about the imaginaries maybe coming back or the places where where repair almost exceeding the intention of the people who engaged the repair produced something that where that felt qualitatively new, which I felt was like a possibility in the things that you described. Um, so I'm just yeah, I'm wondering about this kind of the catalyzing of the new out of repetition um, without being too uh, romantic. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's <laughs> my. As my yeah. instinct is to be romantic about these, uh, but I also wondered empirically where you saw that surprise, where you saw those things that happened almost like this is a kind of contingency, right, that happens when these activities take place that yeah. don't have a, don't necessarily have a, a very, like a predefined goal, um, but yeah. really loved the theoretical work that you're doing in, on, on repair, really appreciated mm -hmm. it very much. Yeah, thank you. Maria, is it fine if I just respond to that now so that I don't lose? <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Bronwyn. That's actually really, really useful um, as a reflection. And I think you've actually picked up on the point in the paper that I'm really struggling with. Um, it's exactly this, this effort in some way to, like I say, split and name the orientations and to what, what, to what end. But at the same time, I'm struggling with the consequence that it feels like I'm actually taking away from what in fact is very, very important work. Um, so I say that, say that I don't want to valorize it, but I also don't want to take away from it, because I do see exactly what you're saying, that it can be incredibly powerful and in fact serve as the seeds for something, um, even if it's not exactly explicitly clear what it's seeding <laughs> and where it leads. Um, so I totally agree with you, and I think it's part of what I'm struggling with, and I, I think also part of what I'm struggling with is to like really bring in the stuff on social reproduction and care and to think about it more carefully um, in, in how, how I open the conversation. And, and again, to not kind of present it as, you know, these are these three slices and they are in contrast to each other necessarily. 
Um, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, Suraya. Thank you, uh, Bronwyn. Very nice uh, question and answer. And uh, Yedis uh, was next. Uh, maybe, yeah, we can start with Yedis. And, uh... Hi, sir. I am Yedis. I really enjoyed Hi. the presentation and I have a lot of questions. So I guess maybe we could meet in person or over Zoom at some time. That would uh, be great. Because yeah. for me, what kind of I was thinking throughout your presentation that you, well, in the beginning, you mentioned precarity in passing, but you kind of didn't really go into depth about it. And I was kind of thinking that if we look at kind of more post-structuralist work on precarity, like Judith Butler, mm -hmm. it's something that cannot be overcome or repaired. It's kind of an ontological condition of vulnerability. So I thought that kind of the way you framed it, your kind of research context in the beginning, it, there was like some sort of theoretical tension that that kind of condition that is inevitable in urban city, in urban life, especially mm -hmm. with neoliberalization of cities and structural forms of violence. Mm -hmm. How do we decide theoretically and methodologically when these kind of acts are repair or are they kind of just responding to violence mm -hmm. and precarity? Mm -hmm. So it's not a criticism of your work in any sense. I think, yeah. you know, there's a lot to read and I really want to read this paper, but I was just kind of thinking also about Lauren Bredeland's work on cruel optimism which right. I don't know if you're familiar, but this repair mm -hmm. and framing these things as repair repairs a form of cruel optimism that it gives hope mm -hmm. in the sense of addressing things to an extent whilst the violence is still very much overwhelming and overpowering because the struggle still continues and it will continue. So I was kind of thinking about these things that again, this is not a criticism, this is just something yeah. that I would like to discuss with you further. Yes, yes, that's, thank you. That's a fascinating reflection. And I think in my more pessimistic moments, I completely agree with you. And in other times, I really do want to look for the hope in relation to the despair. Um, and in some ways to believe that it is somehow being constructed. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with what you're saying about Judith Butler and this ont ontological condition of vulnerability that it can never be repaired. But I can see what you're saying about there's a violence that you're constantly mitigating against. And so that was really initially in reading some of this earlier work on repair, uh, especially the insistence that we need to pay attention to repair at the level of collective life. Um, as much as I appreciated it, it annoyed me for exactly that reason, because I felt like it's still not grappling with the stuff that is necessitating those practices in the first place. And so we will just keep going in the, in the same sense that Maria talks about resilience, right? Mm -hmm. So, but then I didn't want to, I didn't want to just leave it there. And so I think through thinking with Sissy Goolhouse, I was trying to see what does this actually look like? not in my imagination or in my reading of the theory, but in my deep paying attention and spending time and building relationships, uh, which in itself was hard labor, um, exhausting and emotional work. Um, and so these are some of the provisional things that come through and they are absolutely provisional. And I suppose they can be very easily <laughs> crumbled or crushed, you know? But, but I think there's a part of me that feels like in spite of all of that, I do want to see where the hope is and I will continue to look for it because what else is there? And I just to intervene because it's very near, it's this beautiful question, beautiful answer. But I, I think uh, what you're describing uh, actually happening there is beyond, uh, is something much more powerful than hope because hope has an element of passivity. Mm. You know, we, mm -hmm. we hope, this will happen. We hope we put our hope here, put our hope there. That's not the case. This is people taking their lives and their housing in their hands. So it's yeah. a very act, act, yeah. activist praxis. And mm. I would be cautious of using the word hope because it's so much more than just hope. Mm. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's also useful. Because mm -hmm. I keep thinking about this tension between hope and despair, but. Yeah. You're right, that the response is something more, it's, it's more deliberate and defiant. Yeah. 
Um, thank you. I, I just just say that I put Soraya's without consulting her, but I put Soraya's email on this in the chat uh, because she did ask me to get in touch with people. So if any of you wants to follow up on this discussion, Soraya is with us. So please uh, email her to follow up. And uh, I move to uh, Joao uh, had a question. Please go ahead. Right. Thanks so much, Soraya. That was amazing and very moving as well. And uh, I hope we can meet. I also have a lot of questions and very curious about your work. But I have a, uh, throughout your presentation, I've had the Brazilian case in, uh, mm -hmm. in my mind all the time. I think there are a lot of similarities between um, housing occupations and all kinds of different urban occupations in South Africa and also in Brazil over the last decades. And there is one dimension that I think uh, maybe you didn't mention or it's not present in your research, but I really wanted to hear more about it. It's the question of temporality. Mm -hmm. As, uh, this is a very important question, at mm -hmm. least for scholars working on Brazilian occupations. Mm -hmm. and what uh, they have found is that after a few months or years of very intense radical experimentations, prefiguration, a, a lot of different uh, social distribution of care work and all this kind of stuff after sometimes uh, what happens most of the times not always of course is that social movements kind of lose their contact to the occupiers move somewhere else and i mean everybody goes uh, back to their everyday life as as usual so there's a lot of discussions on what are the conditions for really keeping those practices those mm -hmm. the new that's out there and I mean, how, how it can be endured, how it can be uh, overcome this kind of uh, shortcut temporality. Yeah, if you could just, mm. thank you. Yes, thank you. That's really useful. Um, I mean, I've been thinking a little bit about it and maybe it didn't come through in the presentation, but just in the infrastructural sense, you know, this recognition that infrastructures are incomplete. Complete. And so I suppose in the same way, occupation and occupational practices are incomplete and always process. And at the same time, that's not linear, right? It's not like this movement from here to there, but there's more of a circularity and an uncertainty and a fragility. But I totally agree with you that bringing that in and thinking with it um, is important, not only conceptually, but also just in trying to understand um, the, the, the maintenance and the sustaining of these um, and also the lulls, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Maria, if I could just say that um, I will be in Amsterdam in the week of the 25th, so I do hope to meet many of you in person. Um, and I would really welcome emails and, and an ongoing conversation. But also these days, for us at least, this one-to-one uh, -one Zoom is also very common. So if um, you don't want to narrow it to that period when you're yeah. here, then... Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Joao, for a great question and, and answer. Um, this is a really beautiful conversation. And I hate to say we've um, come to five o'clock, but maybe if there is uh, one last question, we can take it. Um, and if not, then you can um, get in touch with Soraya directly to, to follow up on your work and her work and on synergies. Okay, um, I don't uh, see any hands. Um, I would like to uh, say a huge thanks again to Suraya for a, a, a really inspiring talk. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you for inspiring questions, really pushing it forward. And yeah. uh, this is really, really the way it, uh, we like it to be and often is. So thank you all. Uh, have a very good evening and uh, we'll see you at the next dialogue here and Francesca will uh, uh, notify us uh, in due course about our next uh, talk. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.